right, we're going to spend a few minutes reviewing where we left off last time, and then we're going to bring some more um, thoughts into it, a few few additional concepts um, about PHP that are important. If you remember last, uh, where we left off was um, we created uh, functions and include files, and we did that to increase the reusability of this. We took something, a little calculation, in our case it was a currency calculation, and we created functions for that, and then we created an include file for those functions. And that allows us to put that include file on any page that needs to do this calculation, and we're all set. All right? The function is very loosely coupled to the page. In other words, the function doesn't depend on what page it's on. The function is self-contained, I guess is another way to put it. Everything the function needs to do its job is given to it by the arguments of the function, and the result of the function is in the return value. That allows us to put it on any page. doesn't matter where the parameters are coming from or what we're going to do with the results. In our case, we, when we did the currency conversion, we went and we displayed the results on the page. But you might not always display the results on the page. You may, for example, take the results of the function of the currency conversion and add up a bunch of them. If you had an order, I'm thinking. And you might, um, you know, you might take and figure out the tax and convert that to a different currency and instead of displaying it, just add it to the total or something like that. So the idea of a function is it doesn't matter where the data comes from, and it doesn't matter what happens to the result. The function is self-contained. It's given arguments, and it returns the result. So let's look at this code and review that for a minute, and then we'll move on. going to extract it to the desktop. Of course, you have no idea what I'm doing because I don't have the projector on. So let me go and do that. in CINETPUB WW root. Now I'm going to request it again. We can't just double click on this, remember, because um, 
we now have server-side scripts, which means the server has to process it to get the web page. So if I type in the value or the name of one of the pages, chart.php was one of them, there I get my conversion chart of um, dollars to yen to euros to pounds. The same calculation I have in the form. where we put in a dollar amount and we can pick what we want converted and we get that result. Now the nice thing is, is this is sharing the code for the calculation. It's not sharing the code for the user interface. In other words, these, these, both these pages get the values, get the parameters for the functions from different places. And we do something a little bit different with the results. But the code that actually does the calculation is shared. So if we look at that, that is in currency.inc. INC indicates include. Um, typically, that you, you use the INC extension. Um, that way, that distinguishes your include files from your complete pages. If you notice here, it simply consists of the PHP functions that we've created. We can put anything in an include file. We can put anything that you can put in a PHP page in an include file. In this particular case, all we have is PHP code. We have our convert function for dollars to yen, pounds, and euros. It accepts an argument. It does a calculation based on the argument, and then it returns a result. Remember, the argument is a placeholder. Every time this function gets called, whatever value the calling code puts in there is going to be used and um, going to be used as part of the calculation. And then we return the results. And that way, whoever calls the function can use the results however it needs to. So that is the include file. If we look at the chart code itself, we'll notice that we have the include file included in here. We have a loop that iterates through 100 times. And the value that we're going to convert is contained in the variable i. So that's what we use to call the function. We put the result in a variable called yen, and then we output that result. We also use the same code. in the calculation where we get the value from the query string. All right. And we get the value from the query string for dollars and we then do the calculations and do a similar thing. Again, the function is expecting a parameter for the value of dollars and it returns the result, whether it be in yen, pounds, or euros. Questions about this? The uh, underscore get. Yes. Now, if we were to use the post method, okay. would that have to change accordingly? To yes. Post? All right. Uh, in fact, that's a good point. Let me, let's make a second version of this. Let's make... Let's make a second version of this form called form post and we'll call it process post. All right, now let's go and edit form post. I'm going to change the method on the form from get to post. What does that mean? All right. If you notice here with the form, when I put in a value 
any of the values that are in the form, when I click convert, they're displayed up in the query string. They're included as part of the URL. That is because I chose the get method to that. Now, that's okay and that's acceptable to do in this case. There's really no sensitive information up here. But in other cases where, for example, you're putting a password, you would not necessarily want a password up there to be shown up in the query string. All right. So you might want to use a post method instead. The post method is going to pass the data from page one to page two, but it's not going to put it in the query string. It's going to put it somewhere else. It's going to put it as part of the request object that gets sent. So if I go in here and I change the method from get to post, and I change the action, Remember, the action is the name of the script that's going to be called from process2 to process post. All right. If I go and pull this up, still on the desktop. All right. If I put this on here, notice a couple things. First of all, we're getting a validation error saying must enter a number. Well, we entered a number. Second thing is you notice it's not displayed up there. It's not displayed up there because we used a process uh, or, or we used a, uh, a method of post as opposed to a method of get. All right. So the problem in process.post is what? The problem is, is that the data is not where this script expects it to be is pulling it from the query string. There's nothing on the query string for that. So therefore, we get an error. Okay, so how do we fix that? We fix that by changing from get to post. And it's not going to let me save it. Well, let me save it up on the desktop. Why do we get that result? Well, you can probably figure it's still looking for that on the query string. It's looking for the checkbox to indicate if we want euros or yen. It's looking for it on the query string. So we need to change those from get to post as well. So what's the difference? Well, it's the difference between is numeric and is set. Is set is looking to see if there's any value in there. Is, is numeric is looking to see if the value in there is numeric. So, for example, if I did the, set, the test is set and I entered in an ABC, is set would return true. There's a value there. Is numeric would return false because that value is not numeric. 
All right, so let's go and I corrected the other two and move it over. And we should be back in business. <laughs> or not. Oh, I only did some of these. I tell you. You know, any other day that might have been annoying, but, you know, it's the first day back from spring break, so we're still. All right, finally it should work because I changed all of the gets to post. There we go. All right, we're back in business. So, again, you have a choice. If you pass it on to query string, and, again, a lot has to do with how else you're going to use it. Remember that that process page could actually be called from another, from a couple places. And let's think of an example. We could have a um, we could have a page that looks up a book, you know, like on Amazon, based on the book's ID number. All right. We might want to pass that on the query string. Why? Because we might do a search and create that page based on the ID number or title or whatever and display that. But we might want to hard code a link on our home page that says, here is this new book, in which case we could create a link that says, you know, um, a href equals show book dot php question mark id equals one, two, three, four, five, six. So we could hard code it in there. We could actually create that. Or we could have a server side script that looks for the featured books and put them on the home page or something like that. So if you're going to access the page from a bunch of different methods, you might want to use the get method because then you can pass it via a form or pass it via a hard-coded link. With the post, you have to access it by a form. So if you're only going to access that second page by the form, you would use the post. Um, the post is good if there's some, some kind of sensitive data. Now, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble by just changing post to request. I know this is going to be one of those things like, why, why don't you just show us this the first time? All right. But I could go in and look for underscore post and replace with underscore request. Underscore request works regardless of where it is, whether it's on the query string or whether it's passed as part of the forms collection, whether it's posted. So underscore request finds it in either of the two places. The only drawback I can think of using underscore request is it is possible to use to pass data on the query string and pass data via the forms collection. And what happens if you had the same variable both on the query string and the forms collection? My answer to that question is if you're doing that, you deserve to have problems. All right? Because you shouldn't, you know, why do that? That needlessly complicates it. So typically I use request. Um, and that way if I change the form from post to get, 
it doesn't matter. All right. Questions about this? Now, we used include files for another purpose as well. We used include files to kind of give us a shell of a page that um, we can fill in and we can sort of make a template and put it all in include files. Now, someone asked the question via email, I don't recall who, would it be better to have one big include file that would include your header, your navigation, or would it be better to have three separate include files? My answer was it's better to have three separate include files. Any idea why? For easy editability, you know, if you break it down into smaller chunks, a lot of times it's easier to, to do it. Um, any other reason? You might not need all those pieces on a, on a given page. All right, it's, it's possible. Um, you might want to rearrange them. You might want to have a couple different layouts for something. All right. All these are reasons for that. The idea is, is that the more focused something is, the more single purpose that something is, the easier and the more it lends itself to reusability. So if I had one big include file that had a bunch of stuff in it, that had a bunch of HTML in it, and I put that I would have to get everything. I couldn't pick and choose the pieces that I wanted. And I couldn't rearrange those pieces. So I think in terms of blocks. If you're doing a wireframe, you know, you sketch out a wireframe of your web page. And you have the typical looking header, navigation, content area, this is likely to be different on each page, and then you have a footer, then maybe you have an aside, sidebar. You might have other pages that don't have the sidebar. Or you might have other pages that don't need the footer. Or you may decide to <coughs> change things and put your navigation along the top, which you should be able to do if you use CSS, then your header, then body, and then footer. By breaking things down to like a single purpose component, it allows us to be more flexible in creating things. And that's like a rule that applies a lot of places in software development. Think of a function, all right? If I had a function, let's say I was writing a payroll system, and I had a function that calculated withholding tax, that calculated net pay withholding tax, tax withheld, and gross pay or net pay rather, all right? If it did those three things and returned the result, and the result being net pay, all right? I couldn't then call that function and just get the taxes. Maybe in a particular case, I'm just doing a calculation and I'm not printing a paycheck and I don't need the net pay. I need a total of the amount of tax that's gonna be withheld from the upcoming pay or something along those lines. So if a, punct, if a function does three things, I have to do all three things every time I call it. It would be better to break my function down into three functions then, one that calculates gross pay, one that calculates um, taxes, and one that calculates net pay. And then I can have a sort of a wrapper function that does all of them, but the work is done in the individual functions. Then I can mix and match, and I can call the pieces I need and not call the pieces that I don't need. All right? So again, when you're thinking of creating these little components, and again, I use the word component because a function is a component, an include file is a component, it's something you can pop in somewhere and just use it, all right? 
the more single purposed that that component is, the more apt that you have to be able to reuse, reuse it and to make it maintainable. All right. So what can I put in here? I could put anything that I could put in a PHP file. All right. So how could we use this? And again, we're not going to go into great details, but in our example, we just have plain old HTML in the header, nav, and footer. All right. We could do something if we wanted to, like in the sidebar. We could include some PHP code in here to do something like look up the user's location display the store that's closest to the user. Let's say we're doing a website for a chain of grocery stores or something. It could grab the location. How does it grab the location? Well, we've seen examples with Google, right, where you type in, do a search, and it knows where we are based on our IP address, or at least it approximately knows where we are, and it gears its results to us. Well, if we were a, um, if we were a grocery chain, let's say, and we had stores across the area, we could do the similar thing to grab the location and then do a little lookup in our database to display the closest um, store to, to us. Or we could display the weather for this area or whatever. We could do it localized. So the examples I gave, um, the include files were all HTML. All right? But keep in mind that we could... Um, customize those based on um, some parameters, just like we could do any PHP page. We could even do something with the styling of the page based on where the user is located. If we had a sports site, for example, we could um, similarly do a location lookup and um, display a different theme. You know, if we notice a person was in Ohio, we could do Ohio State colors, for example. We could actually pull a different style sheet up or do some tweaking of the colors or something like that. So we could use JavaScript, CSS, anything like that. All right. The idea is, is that it's the same as with HTML can be a mix of PHP and HTML or CSS or JavaScript. Now that's getting into some little tricky territory, uh, but it is something that you can do. All right? And it works the same way. You have, a, you have code that is either your HTML or your JavaScript or whatever. The server looks, and then you have some PHP code. The server evaluates and decides if the code simply is sent to the client or if the server needs to process the PHP. If it needs to process the PHP, it does that, and then it outputs the relevant stuff to the client. So that's something you can play with if you, if you want. All right, next thing. Let's look at our form again. And let's notice a problem, especially if we consider a larger form, or maybe there was several pieces of information. show you something and again imagine that the, the form had more information right now this form has four fields but imagine if it had 10 fields or 20 fields or something like that 
All right, I display the form and I hit submit. if I wanted to, to, to get the look of a whole table or, or whatever. All right, I'm going to save it. Again, save it to the desktop and copy it over. Oops. And now I have my form and my chart. I click on the chart and chart.html but if I correct it in one place it corrects it everywhere and there we go there we have my hard coded chart now again we can imagine that this looks really pretty and that a designer went and made the world's greatest looking table in here, all right? And it's my job as a programmer just to add the functionality to it. Let's look at this HTML code. Because effectively, Effectively, other than the include file, we're just plain old HTML. What part of this do I need to change? If you can see the line numbers, yell out the line numbers that I need to change. Okay. Okay. The table headers are pretty much right. This is the same. All right. This is the same. Really, what I want to do is I want to change lines 31 through 36. How do I want to change them? I want to change them two different ways. One way is I want to repeat it a hundred times. Right? I don't want just one row in my table. I want 100 rows in the table. I want to do the conversion for $1, $2, $3, $4, all the way through 100. So the first thing I want to do is I want to include this in some sort of loop that's going to repeat 100 times. What's the second thing I want to do? The second thing I want to do is I want to actually do the calculation instead of having hard-coded numbers, all right? So let's do this one step at a time. Again, if that is one of the main messages I try to impart to students is you don't necessarily have to do everything all at once. Notice in this case even how I'm doing it in steps. The first step, I'm not even writing a PHP page. I'm hard-coding an HTML table just to get the look of it down. Now I'm going to go in and do the next phase of it. I'm going to make it instead of having one table row, it has 100 table rows. Then finally, in the last step, I'm going to actually go and do the calculation. It's so much easier to do that. And you would not believe the number of 
times like students will show me their code and they'll have a hard time finding an error and frankly no wonder they're having a hard time finding an error I'm having a hard time finding the error in there because they're showing me a gigantic set of code with you know dozens of lines in it and the error somewhere in there well where is it I don't know it's like a needle in a haystack if you do a little tiny piece at a time then Hey, if I change one of five lines, if it stopped working, I'm pretty sure that errors in one of those five lines that I just changed. All right? Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a loop so that it creates my table row 100 times. How do you suppose I'm going to do that? I don't really need another include file unless I was going to reuse it. All right. Now, in this case, um, there's no real indication that I would ever need to do exactly this thing again. So I'm not going to create an include file for this. What am I going to do? Well, what allows us to repeat a block of instructions a certain number of times? A loop. Right. And specifically, in this case, I know the number of times I want to do this, so I'm going to do a for loop. So, I'm going to say for. dollar sign i equals 1. What does that represent? dollar sign i equals 1. Yeah, the, the, right. The, this is where the variable is going to start out with. All right. In other words, the first trip through the array, I'm sorry, the first trip through the loop, the variable i is going to have a value of 1. dollar sign i less than or equal to 100 represent? How many times it's going to run through? How many times it's going to run through? In other words, this is going to continue the loop as long as this is true. So as long as i is less than or equal to 100, we're going to take another trip through the loop. When i gets to be a value of 101, we're going to stop. And we're not going to execute the loop again. I plus plus indicates what? It's going to increase the value of that variable by one each time through. Now we could do in that chart, we could do every 10, right? We could start I off at 10 and then do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And that might be something you might want to play around with with the example, just to get a little more familiar with loops on how to do that. Okay. Now, this can be a little confusing, but here I'm going to pop out of PHP. Why? Because I have a chunk of HTML I want to output. And here I get back into PHP mode. Because I want to close my loop. So notice that the loop starts here. All this stuff is in the part is part of the loop, and then boom, that here closes the loop up here. That's one thing that can be confusing about PHP until you get used to it is that you can start a PHP instruction in one PHP block and end it in another. So you can do this with loops, you can do this with if statements, you can do that with um, 
any sort of statement. So what this is saying effectively is this is the block of statements that's going to get executed 100 times. Another way to put it is we're going to output 100 rows to this table. Now, these rows aren't correct yet, right? I'm not doing any real calculations here. I'm going to have the exact same row duplicated 100 times. So we're not done yet, but we're making progress. So let's go and let's look at this. And I hit refresh, and there we go. We have 100 rows. And I ask you to take my word for it and not make me count them. But there's 100 rows here that go. All right. So, our last step is to make this do the actual calculation. And to do that, we're obviously going to need to pop into PHP mode again. All right. What should the value of this cell be? What should I put in here? Okay, so how do I output the value of I? Okay, move it in the right direction, but we need a little bit more. Well, first thing we need to do, and maybe, maybe you assume this, but first thing we need to do is out, get into PHP. What else do we need to do? If I did dollar sign I, would that be enough? No, we already set up I equal to 1 up here. What do we want to do to dollar sign I? We want to output it, right? How, that is, we want to send it to the browser. So what do we do to output something to the browser? Echo. Now again, I'm going to test this now, even though I know I'm not done, but just to test the progress that I've made. See if I am moving in the right direction. So I'll go and save this and run it. And now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up through 100. So we're making progress with that. All right, what are we going to do here? Well, we need to go into PHP mode. We know that. We know we have to echo something. All right. What is it that we are echoing? What do we want to do? It's the value for yen. How are we going to get the value for yen? We'll call the function and we'll pass it the i variable. So I have to refresh my memory what the name of the function was. Convert dollars to yen. And I could do this a couple different ways. But I'm going to do it this way. Just because it might be more straightforward. do my calculation and store the result in my variable called yen and then I'm going to echo yen. All right. And again, this could be done a few 
different ways, but this is the way that I've chose to do it. Let's test this part out. Again, notice what I'm doing is I'm, I'm literally changing one tiny piece of it, testing it. If something breaks, I know that the thing that I've changed most recently is probably the culprit. All right. I should go and do the math, but I'm assuming that this is probably pretty correct. All right. Now, last thing I have to do is I have to do the same thing for euros and dollars. I'm sorry, euros and um, pounds. So I'm getting bold. But I think we can see, based on the other things, how this is going to work. consistent, right? Because I'm using the same function. So if I go to my form and put in six dollars, I get six is 5.4, 17, 3.9. I go to my chart, I get the same results. They're in a slightly different order, but I get essentially the same results. Now, if something were to happen and the value of the dollar compared to the yen or, or pound or euro changed, all I need to do is change it in one place. So again, in a real application, this would probably do some sort of database lookup or call some sort of service to get that. But if the calculation changed, think in terms of shipping calculation or anything like that, all I would need to do is change it in the one place, and that change would be reflected across all pages that used that calculation. So that calculation no longer is tied to one specific page. That calculation um, exists um, across several pages. And again, notice how simply by starting off with a mocked up HTML page and then slowly looking and adding the PHP, I was able to go in a fairly straightforward manner to create the chart that I wanted to from this. Questions about this? because me and David were kind of talking about this a little bit in lab. Typically, the, the, the biggest benefit for using PHP is for creating the HTML. But there are cases when you could use PHP to create the other stuff too, and you could put it in an include file and all that. Uh, an example of that is like with Angel. With Angel, you can theme your page, right? You can choose a, a color scheme or whatever. In that case, there's a script on the server that creates not just the HTML, but creates the CSS. So yes, you could, in an include file, you could have the CSS and you could have the PHP actually choosing between different colors and outputting the CSS and all that. So to answer your question, yes, um, it is possible to do that. 
Um, and um, I don't know exactly how common it would be, but it certainly is something that, that is workable and is especially beneficial if you want to make like the way the page looks dynamic. In other words, different from user to user. Or if you had a scheme where, depending on the day of the year or the time of the day, you could make the page look different, you know. Um, depending on the weather, you could make the page look different. Uh, I, I know sometimes on my on my phone, depending on oh, the background set, my, the background of my phone will look different. Like if it's sunny out, it'll you'll see a sunshine. If it's rainy out, you'll see drops of water and all that. Well, you could do something similar to that on a web page in a dynamic way, and you could include styling or you could include the PHP to, to create some of the styling just like it's creating the HTML. So there's certain instances where it's Certain, certain instances that, you, you, that, that it, you could and it would be a good idea to do that. Other questions? All right. Next week is spring break. All right, so we do not have classes. Um, you can certainly continue to send me um, emails um, over spring break and I will be working hard to catch up on stuff and planning the second half of the semester and hopefully getting some rest in too. All right. Okay, any questions? We'll see you in lab. Does anyone have a USB drive I can borrow?